being here, and we will get started. I am Adi Ignatius. I'm the editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review. And I will introduce my panel, my very big panel, uh, in just a second. But I, I want to sort of set up the topic. So the, the, the name of this session is The Role of Business in a Changing World. And in our discussions before this, we thought we would focus on a couple of areas. And one is the big area that we've been talking about at some of the earlier sessions today. And that really is kind of geopolitical complications, trade war tariffs, um, how that is affecting uh, you know, business now and, and US-China business. We also want to talk about some other external pressures that businesses in the US and China are, are facing now. I mean, it, it almost feels like we're entering a new phase in, let's say, capitalism, that the Reagan era, if you want to call it that, where companies really focused on maximizing shareholder return that CEOs felt that was their duty above any, anything else, I think is giving way to a new era. I don't know what the new era is going to look like, but it feels like change is out there. It feels like there's pressure from employees that want to work for companies that have a sense of purpose. There's pressure from customers who want to buy from a company that they think shares their values. I mean, there was a statistics I read, statistic I read recently where 81% of, I think it was from Edelman, 81% of customers said they want to buy a product from a company that shares their values, a product. So that fits into the mix. And then increasingly, investors are paying attention to these sort of intangibles, ESG, environmental, social, governance factors, in addition to just financial fundamentals. So I, we're in a different era, and I think that puts pressure on companies. It also gives companies more positively a chance to create a kind of economic advantage for themselves if they get that right. So let me introduce the panel, and then we'll jump into a discussion. After a little while, I would love to open it to questions from the floor, so, um, so be ready for that. So, uh, so here's our panel. So to my immediate left is Craig Allen, who is president of the US-China Business Council, which is a trade association that represents US companies doing business in China. Um, to his left is Elaine uh, Dzenski, who is founder and managing partner of LumaRisk, which is a strategic risk advisory practice. To her left is Victor Gao, who is vice president, Center for China and Globalization, which is a Beijing-based think tank dedicated to the study of Chinese policy and globalization. Um, to his left is Huang Jian, who is general manager, Chinese enterprise of Chinese Telecom Americas Corp., which is a US-based subsidiary of China Telecom. Uh, to his left is Maggie Chan Jones, founder and chief executive officer of Tenshi, which is a startup dedicated to advancing gender diversity. And all the way down there is uh, Wang Shuguang, Sunny Wang, who's vice chairman of the Changsha based Broad Group, which makes HVAC and uh, air conditioning units and other sort of big, big building processes. So it's a great panel. We have a lot of perspectives, a lot to cover, but I want to kind of start at this sort of high altitude, and Craig, since you're right next to me, I'll let you start. You know, what, is it, what are the challenges for, for China-based U.S. companies now? What does it feel like to be a U.S. company in China these days? Well, I think it's, uh, this is a very difficult time for both Chinese companies based in the U.S. and U.S. companies uh, based in China. And probably the most uh, stark statistic is that uh, Chinese investment in the U.S. Uh, was uh, down some 80% uh, last year. Uh, falling off of uh, a cliff. And uh, there have been new restrictions uh, put on Chinese investment into the United States as of se September six 16. And thus, uh, I think that we could expect that Chinese uh, investment will continue to decline. Um, U.S. investment in China remains strong. We do a survey every year of our members, and some 97% in last year reported that they were profitable and that's very enviable. But that really masks uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of doubt and a lot of risk and a lot of uh, worry among our members. Um, and the risk and the doubt comes in many ways. There was a recent survey by the Brunswick Group, which Bob Zellick is associated with, that said 56% of Chinese consumers were trying to avoid buying American goods. Now let's do the math for a second. 56% of Chinese consumers is 11% of the world's population. 
And when 11% of the world's population is actively trying to avoid American goods, that could uh, have a uh, profound uh, effect. Uh, but it could get worse. Uh, and many of these areas are outside of uh, the company's control. So looking at American companies in China, uh, generally, one can recall the lines of Tolstoy that every happy family is happy in the same way, and every unhappy company, in the case of American companies in China, is unhappy in their own unique way. And that's really very true as a result of the tariffs and all of uh, the tensions. But let me just summarize and say, consumer goods, uh, they're doing pretty good. Uh, Chinese economy is strong, uh, so they're doing well. Industrial uh, companies generally doing well for the same uh, reason. Uh, ag companies are in a little bit of pain uh, because of the tariffs, uh, and there's a great deal of uncertainty hanging over them. Services are a mixed bag. Consumer services are doing very well, uh, but um, uh, other types of he heavily regulated services are in some trouble uh, because they require approvals which may not be coming. But it's really the tech companies that are struggling the most. Uh, and all tech companies are facing uh, enhanced regulatory requirements, uh, both from the American government and the Chinese government, and it is becoming more and more difficult to be fully compliant if you're an American company operating in China or a Chinese company operating in the US. And that uh, uh, just uh, leads to yet more and more feelings of uh, uncertainty. So let me stop there and happy to carry on later. Okay, well let me just follow up on a couple things. So I, I was at a discussion recently about risk and the way companies are thinking about global risk now. And China was, uh, or the U.S.-China relation was relationship was a topic, and people were speculating that if things get worse, that some of the big losers could be Boeing, which is competing for I think China's buying a trillion dollars worth of planes in the next few years, whatever it is, next decade or two. Um, the NBA, <laughs> uh, you know, Apple, which sells something like 25 percent of its products in Greater China, but then even at a at a more basic level, I mean, Starbucks was had been imagining a future where at some point in the not too distant future it would flip where China would become the biggest market over the US. Um, if you're right, that figure 61% say, and it's only say that sure. they don't wanna buy US goods, that's a problem. Then, so I guess my follow-up question is, do we really believe that figure? Right. Uh, I would have to say that most of our consumer goods companies are not reporting uh, a decline in sales and so this is Chinese uh, respondents, consumers, who uh, are replying as a, uh, in a politically correct manner. Yeah. Uh, but we are not yet seeing that. But I think that we do ourselves and all companies a disservice if we underestimate the power of Chinese nationalism. Uh, we know how strong uh, that is, and we wish to remain on, on the right side of na uh, Chinese nationalism and carry on uh, just a normal exchange uh, between our, our companies. So I'll, I'll, I'll double down again and say on the, on the consumer goods side, fine, industrial, generally fine, agricultural, mixed, services, mixed, tech, problem. Okay. So Sunny Wong, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, just for balance then, you know, what is it like then to be representing a Chinese company in the US? What is it like to be facing the, you know, the tariff regimen. Okay, thank you, Ali. And uh, I'd like to brief uh, background information about my company and uh, myself. Uh, I bought group in Chinese means uh, Yanda Kongtiao. It's a private enterprise with 300 employees headquartered in Changsha, China. And uh, he's a, sorry. Ah. It's open. Hello? No, it's okay? Okay, and uh, a technical issue. <laughs> and uh, uh, as a manufacturer, we uh, experienced a lot of chain challenge in recent years. Uh, but uh, the main challenge uh, 
lines now is a, a, a trade uh, issue, the tariff issue. Uh, you know, Broad and his flagship products is uh, uh, non-electric chiller. We also the, the called the absorption chiller, which is can recycle waste heat for the, uh, the, the thermal demands of the building and uh, industrial process. And it's very energy efficient. And uh, we are the largest manufacturer worldwide. And uh, we benefit our over 25,000 customers in 82 countries by enable them to low carbon, to, to reduce the energy consuming and uh, lower their carbon foot, the footprint. And uh, the interesting thing is that we are the one of the first group of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tariff imposed on the Chinese goods imported from, uh, on the goods imported from China uh, since last June. And, uh, you know, up to 25% increased tariff, no one can make a profit anymore. So we have no choice but to pass this, the cost of the tariff to our end users. Uh, so that's why the trade issue is really hurts uh, uh, China and uh, US uh, business. And uh, until uh, last month, we uh, got the tariff exemption from the trade offices. So it's a good news, but I don't think it's applied to all the Chinese manufacturers. The reason we got the, uh, the exemption of the tariff, I think, first, is no alternative manufacturers in the United States anymore, which is no Americans make the similar products. So all the players in the market, they set their factories in China. And, and so from the supply chain point, so the have to purchase uh, from China. The second thing is about the, you know, I just mentioned the, is the energy efficient uh, products and it's uh, complementary uh, uh, with the uh, US based uh, uh, upstream manufacturers like the uh, turbine and engine manufacturers. We built a very sophisticated energy uh, conservative infrastructure like the coaching or CHP plant. So based on this, I, I, I would like to say that the earlier the ending the trade war, trade uh, conflict uh, is better for both of them. Yeah. By the way, if, if any panelists want to jump in at any time, feel free. I've urged everyone to do this family style, interrupt, argue, you know, throw things. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there are no rules. Um, but OK, so Elaine, let me ask you. A lot of the, the scrutiny of companies, their performance, their adherence to kind of the, the social ESG kind of depends on sp supply chains. Um, and I guess, you know, that's something I know you, you study. What are, what are the challenges and opportunities these days for companies that are managing complex supply chains, particularly involving countries like China? Yeah, well, I think it's gotten a bit more complex over the last couple of years. Um, well, first of all, I, I think there's, um, one prevailing notion that applies to CEOs in the C-suite, which is uh, there's no plausible deniability anymore about what's happening within your organization, what's happening across your supply chains. You're expected to know what's happening within your organization. Um, I think this is critical uh, because there is much more scrutiny now on the, if, you, if I may call it, the social contract uh, between business leadership and citizens. Uh, and this plays into uh, the sustainability question in a big way. Um, so I want to kind of go at it from the perspective of uh, governance and the governance model that we need to be talking about in the context of these pretty complex dynamics. So over the last day and a half now, we've talked about the political uh, dimensions, uh, this emerging tension, which has really always been there, uh, from an ideological perspective between the U.S. and China, but because the economic connection is eroding, uh, it's, it's not a safe space <laughs> anymore, right? Uh, and the emerging political dynamics are, uh, I mean, in a sense, are much more intractable. I don't see this going away anytime soon, but this is going to put a lot more pressure on companies and supply chains in terms of how they operate 
what does the contract look like? What are the expectations? Uh, and what are the models that are going to be driving uh, how uh, businesses serve citizenry? Right. Uh, I think this is this is a, this is a conversation that's developing. Um, so we've also talked about these broader themes around global governance failure, trust in governance, uh, how that has really diminished over the last five to ten years. Um, and, and again, this is kind of reflective of this environment where there's a real question about uh, leadership across public sector and private sector and how that gets translated into business models and again, going back to this notion of the, the, the social contract. So what does it mean from a, a more tangible perspective uh, if I'm a US company or a Chinese comp company operating in this environment? Well, I think companies need to look more closely at the operating framework around their governance structures and what I would call the integrity model. So what does this contract look like? Uh, how, if I'm the CEO, how am I thinking about my impact, uh, not only from an environmental perspective, but from a broader uh, social perspective, and how do I fit into this dynamic in a way uh, that adds something valuable to society. Because there's another trend, which I think we need to talk about, which is a growing citizen awareness of what's happening across political and economic systems. And that uh, ultimately will result in more scrutiny, I think, around business models. Um, so there's a, there's a governance conversation that needs to be had. Uh, now, going at that is difficult because of the current environment. Because frankly, we don't have a deep sense of trust around the conversations, right? Certainly not from a public-private perspective. It's getting harder and harder to have conversations. I mean, here we are. Um, I think we all feel quite fortunate that we're able to be here to have a conversation. Um, but I'm noticing that uh, we don't have one official here from Washington, DC, right? That's kind of a problem, <laughs> to be honest. Um, we know the reasons for that. Um, but uh, it's a challenging environment in which to have a more collaborative conversation uh, and to um, try to repair these networks of trust that are needed to have the right conversation. So, um, so if these dynamics aren't working to the benefit of these conversations, having these conversations, what can business do? I think there is a role for finding uh, a more common language that uh, businesses can use to engage with each other. Uh, so one example of what I would call a common language is uh, doubling down on uh, agreed upon global standards, whether those are standards around IT or data protection or in some of the areas where I work around governance, uh, anti-bribery related global standards. These are the kinds of things um, that help um, create a web of connectivity around this, what I would call the integrity model. So, uh, this is one area where I think we still have safe space to explore uh, how companies can, uh, can move towards um, a, better, uh, a better model of operation. So, to, to finish on, just to follow up on supply chains directly, um, I mean, there's one theory that the fallout from the trade war will be shorter supply chains. Yeah. You know, that, that, that China will have supply chains in the region that will essentially, for, you know, supply goods to their own domestic market, that the U.S. will try to shorten that up as well. I mean, it might, it might make economic sense, but, but that, that, that something fundamentally will change, which is China producing for the world, for the U.S. to, yep. to take. Are you, are you sensing that? I think that's a possibility, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, it goes back to this issue of decoupling um, and what ultimately what that means from a practical perspective on, uh, around the supply chain uh, uh, integrity. Uh, and, and the depth of supply chain. So yeah, I think that's an issue. Um, I mean, we even see it playing out in the, the development space. I wanted to bring in uh, what's happening around the Belt and Road Initiative because I actually think it's critical to this conversation as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the best example that I can come up with in terms of how the political tensions are actually playing out. Uh, so. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but late last year, the U.S. Congress passed uh, the BUILD Act, which uh, authorizes the um, Development Finance Corporation. So this is basically the first um, uh, step that the U.S. is taking to make equity investments in foreign direct investment. And it's a direct response to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because 
it's not so much about putting U.S. government capital, I mean, there's some of that, um, behind new projects. It's about bringing in um, uh, US, U.S. firms um, or Western-based firms and leveraging um, private capital to build uh, foreign direct investment models as a direct response to the VRI, mm -hmm. okay? And so there are some things happening now that suggest that there's going to be um, maybe a broader shift on the part of the U.S. government to get involved. Uh, and ultimately, I think that will have an impact in terms of how supply chains uh, are yep. developed because there are so many uh, potential uh, areas of investment um, that could be tied into that. But that could be an emerging um, tension on a much greater level, yeah. I think. Yes, sir. Yeah. Maggie, do you I would love to jump in. And adding to your, Elaine, your point about governance, when you look at businesses today, we're talking about the changing role of business here is the consumer market is really changing a lot, driven by few goods. One is when you look at you know, the consumer market, 80% of consumer spend is being influenced or directly being directed by women. And the second thing is when you look at the next generation of leaders coming from the, you know, the millennial generation and generation Z, those, you know, those folks in those generations are digital native, both in the US and also in China. So the way they think about how they're gonna purchase from companies are they're looking for ways that are looking to hold accountability of businesses that are gonna be having a purpose, having a mission, so that they would feel more comfortable from buying from them as well. So to your point, Elaine, that you know, the governance becomes so critical for any organizations that are thinking about the global markets, not to mention you know, the huge market in China and in the US. Mm -hmm. So let me turn to Huang Jian. So when you, for China Telecom, America's China Telecom more broadly, is sustainability an opportunity? Is it a problem? I mean, how do you think about sustainability inside the company? Well, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Eddie. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask the audience, is how many of you know about China Telecom? You know the name? Okay, a lot. So how many of you know what we're doing here? <laughs> so that's, that's our friend. Uh, so I have to uh, explain a little bit about what we are doing here. So, so China Telecom Americas is a subsidiary of uh, China Telecom uh, Corporation Limited. Um, we have been here for uh, 18 years. And uh, I have to explain to my Chinese friend, my US friends, every time I met with him, I work for China Telecom, so what are you guys doing here? So we have AT&T Verizon, and what are you guys doing here? Um, we primarily serve all the international company coming from US, uh, from US to China, and also come from China to US for the Chinese enterprise. We help them to build their network between China and the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, the China Telecom uh, has the largest number of cables between China and the United States. So we, we have the larger capacity among all the carriers in the world. Uh, we're very strong in the wire lines because we overpassed Verizon a couple of years ago. Um, however, um, back to uh, the question about you know, uh, stability of this company. 18 years we've been here, so we invest a lot in our network infrastructure, the people. We have over 220 people across American region. And 90, more than 90% of them is a local high, like myself. And uh, so that show the company has a commitment. Um, the corporate customers, or even uh, regular consumer, they will buy the product from you, they will see you have a commitment. You not just come here to this country, just buy something, uh, 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 sell something, and earn the money, and then leave. We're, we're not you know, like that. And the second, I would say from the product or services perspective, any of the companies, if you want to build your advantage in the competition, and you want to enhance your existing product services, you want to have more new product services to serve existing customer as well as the new customer. Because customer, the demand are changing. 
um, and the technology are changing too. So we have to follow, we have to follow that. Um, 18 years ago, 19 years ago, I'll say, we, ha we opened our first rep represented office in, in Los Angeles. The reason I opened that office was because China need to connect to the internet with the 64K, the speed that was in early 2000. And now we're talking about terabytes between the two continents, between the two countries. So technology changing, demand are changing. And at the beginning, we only have uh, um, private lines connected to the, both countries. And now we have different product services, networks. We even have our cell phone services here in the United States where a lot of uh, uh, Chinese students as the customers. So from, um, so back to my second point is that uh, the more services product that we have and uh, the more um, uh, competitive the advantage that you have that will sustain your companies in one of the area. Okay. So Victor, I want to hear from you. And you've sort of listened to everybody. You've lived everywhere. You've lived in the US. You've lived in Hong Kong. You've lived in China. I'm kind of interested in your take on everything we're talking about. You know, basically, um, you know, how you see these issues unfolding, you know, and, and, and what you think it takes to win in business now in this sort of new, new environment. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to meet with many new friends and uh, old friends. I think uh, uh, coming back to the uh, topic of our panel discussion, uh, first of all, this is truly a changing world and the changes are being accelerated. And if we are not aware of the changes, if we are not prepared with the changes, probably we will be buried by, by these changes. Secondly, I think for businesses, uh, uh, in our two countries in particular, I think we need to realize the changes and adapt to the changes. I think this is a world with a lot of uncertainties, but one thing will be certain as far as I'm concerned, that is China and the United States, or the United States and China will remain the two largest economies uh, during the, uh, our lifetime, uh, even including the youngest member in our audience. And I think whatever we do here, whatever we discuss and exchange ideas, will have a major impact on how these two largest economies in the world will interact with each other. A couple of points, you know, we talked about the decoupling of the two economies or of the two countries. I think this is easy said and done. Why? Because if you really look at American companies having operations in China, they do operations in China at least for two purposes. Uh, one is to manufacture in China for export back to the United States or to other parts of the world. But more importantly, they manufacture in China for the domestic market in China. So decoupling, are you talking about closing the corporate door to the China market, which is already the largest consumer market in the world? No, this will be very suicidal for any company, American or otherwise, to walk away from the largest uh, and ever expanding market in China. So I think the decoupling uh, idea is a wrong idea to talk about. And for the trade war, I think this is really the wrong war to uh, uh, fight because all the tariffs, as we just now learned, collected by the US government are paid by the consumers in the United States or by the US corporates. For China, the damage is uh, indirect. For example, some of the companies will need to relocate out of China. Uh, this will cause company closures or uh, loss of jobs in China. But the tariffs, in their real sense of the word, are not paid by the Chinese government. China is, the Chinese government is not selling anything to the US market at all. And uh, therefore, I think the trade war or the tariff war, to be more exact, is the wrong war. It will be bad for China, it's bad for the United States, and the sooner our two countries can put the trade war behind us, the better it will be for China as well as for the United States. Now, another thing I want to mention is that while purely from the Chinese perspective, the United States government is very unilateral in imposing the tariff war, the trade war in China, the United States is probably fighting this trade war against China 
uh, single-handedly in the world because if you look at the major uh, developed countries in other parts of the world, in Europe or in Asia, for example, uh, even though they may have some grievances against China, <coughs> some of which are probably legitimate in themselves, but they are not really writing off the Chinese economy or the Chinese market, they are still very eager to engage with China. And further, to talk about the supply chain, uh, and there is an over-eagerness uh, in some quarters of the US government to disrupt the current supply chain, very much centered in China, I think the United States is not getting any strategic or technical benefits, even if it can disrupt the supply chain. Because you know these manufacturing jobs, even if they are relocating out of China, they are not coming back to the United States. You know, they may go to Vietnam, to the Philippines, or sometimes they go back to Taiwan, etc. But they are not contributing to the resurgence of manufacturing here in the United States. Many of the jobs leaving China, for example, are actually welcomed by the a Chinese nation at all, especially if they are more polluting, for example, not energy efficient, etc. So I think probably both the Chinese government and the American government need to be more philosophical in sizing up each other in a more accurate way, rather than, for example, indulging in each other's fantasies, because the trade war, if it is carried on, will probably be a major trigger to the next global financial crisis. It is expected that something wrong will happen probably around the middle of next year, 2020. So we need to be prepared uh, for both our two countries and our economies. So I would say for the companies in our two countries, we need to do the right thing. For China, we need to step up on many fronts, including, for example, beefing up protection of intellectual property rights and try to become more uh, are transparent to the rest of the world. But on the American side, I hope there will be better understanding of the situation in China for whatever legitimate grievances and complaints, put it on the table so the two countries can really talk about it and we improve ourselves for our mutual benefit. The world should not be a zero-sum game and if we really set up more walls, try to see comfort behind the walls, eventually you may be buried by the wall falling on yourself. That's my point. Okay, great. So I want to open to questions in a second, but, but Maggie, I do want to, to get the issue of technology out here. And I, you know, I, think, I think I have it right that you sort of think about the ability of technology to, the, the twin edges of technology to sort of do good and to do sure. not so good. So could you talk a little bit about that to sort of tee that up before we open to discussion? You know, the, the, the role of technology in in driving both you know, the right and potentially the wrong things forward for US and Chinese companies. Yeah, absolutely, Abby. Um, to give you a little bit of context of my background so you know where I'm coming from, is I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I came to the US when I was 14 years of age. And since then, you know, when I graduated from college in New York, I had always worked in the technology sector for the last couple of decades, um, primarily in really big companies like Microsoft and SAP of the world. And, um, and when I completed my job as the chief marketing officer at SAP in 2017, I decided to found my own company, Tenshi, um, to help women to succeed in corporations. Because when I look around in the C-suite and at the board level, there are very few women. And there are definitely very few women of color. So I want to change that. So to answer your question, when it comes to technology, is, you know, I want to add back to Craig what you said, like in terms of the number, you know, the industries that when we're thinking about the US and China collaborations and the risk is really the innovations. So to give you an idea, and I'm going to ask you a question, so be ready. <laughs> when you think about the population between US and China, which is about 25% of the world's population, right? GDP about 50% of the world. What is the percentage? that it represents the number of unicorns that are coming from these two countries. Representation of the world. What is the percentage of US and China combined number of unicorns, meaning that startup technology companies that are valued at over a billion US dollars? Guesses, come on, throw some numbers. 75, 80, 90. 
50. All right, you guys are pretty good. It's 80%. But when you think about it for a second, 80%, that's huge, coming from two countries. So when you think about the disruptive technologies, thinking about AI, artificial intelligence, thinking about you know, um, facial recognitions, it could really do a lot of good, but if those technologies are not used in the right way, it could also create a lot of harms. To give you an example, in the US, Amazon, as an example, had thought that they could use AI to, um, to help them to you know, figure it out which are the great talents to hire because they get so many resumes, right? But then what they realized was using AI, the great thing about AI is it used the past pattern to predict what's happening in the future so you can get through a lot of data very quickly that human cannot do. But the problem is one of the challenges was that they primarily hired men in the past. So all of a sudden, AI is saying, well, so any resumes that sound like a woman's name or you know, have any women groups on it or coming from colleges, coming from female, like primarily women, those must not be very good candidates. Now we know that is wrong and absolutely the company recognized that and decided to stop using that. But that is exactly as an example on how technology can be used for good but if it is not used correctly, it is also very disastrous for, you know, for people and for talent and also for companies as well. So I think from that regard, it's like innovation as we think about so many ways of thinking about ways to help us to be better in the world. When we think about the UN, the United Nations 17, 17 goals, I personally really believe technology and innovations can really change the world, but the two superpowers of the com countries have to work together to, you know, to really lead the world on the standard um, so that we can really create a better world for the next generations to come. Okay, great. I, I'm not really sure how much time we have, but I know we have some time for questions, so why don't we jump in? We have 10 minutes for questions. So who would like to be the, yes, I, I don't, do we have a microphone or should people just speak loudly? No, translate it. Right here. Ah, so we do need a microphone. Um, Hang on, second row, please. Uh, yeah. All right, great. This is working. Yeah, great. Um, so my question, obviously, the the talk, a lot of the talk concerns, uh, or it's around ways you know China, Chinese, and American businesses can collaborate um, and cooperate. But my question, I guess, is. Zooming out a little bit, it's a little macroeconomic, and I know some of you guys have that background. So how do you guys think about maybe the, the role of kind of the dollar versus the RMB, especially in the context of obviously President Xi's focus on blockchain and some of the central bank digital currency um, initiatives that are now more prevalent in China? And how do you think that maybe affects kind of the, the, the balance of power with respect to the US dollar versus the RMB and knock-on effects to businesses? Is that something that's important now or will it be more so in the future or maybe are there people that think it's more of a distraction and really not that important in the context of what you guys are talking about? Thanks. Who would like that? Go ahead. Uh, I think it's a, a, thank you for the question. I think it's a huge issue. Uh, the, there's a lot of concern in Washington about the idea that the RMB could become uh, a viable reserve currency. I think the jury's out on, maybe not, well, whether it can happen and certainly how quickly that could happen. So that's, I think it's still up for some discussion, um, but there's a big concern about that. Um, from the US perspective, actually we have a lot of equities in this notion of the, you know, the US dollar as a reserve currency, not only from the kind of broader structuring of the global financial system, but also in terms of extraterritorial reach for how the US enforces its laws and regulations and policies, which is oftentimes connected into this idea of US nexus, right? So if you're a Chinese company operating in the US, you come under this concept of US nexus. If you're a US company operating anywhere in the world, you are under the framework of US nexus, which means all laws and regulations apply to you wherever you go. And it's uh, oftentimes the, the dollar that creates the, the nexus, right? 
So I think that the, actually the stakes are quite high and they go beyond some of the uh, more traditional issues that we would think about in terms of uh, the value of a reserve currency. Yeah, if I may add a very quick point, I think uh, when we uh, talk about the BRI initiative, uh, there are some speculations here in the United States that if the United States could force the Chinese economy to slow down, to reduce the Chinese export to the rest of the world, including to the United States, the Chinese uh, foreign reserve income or the foreign reserve in total will reduce. And this will really take the steam off from the uh, BRI initiative. However, I not only think this uh, analysis is fundamentally flawed, but actually it can actually uh, serve a, a reverse purpose. Why? Because when we look at BRI, uh, most of the uh, transactions are now denominated in the dollars. And China is very much uh, involved in providing finance, equipment, labor, designing, construction, you name it. Now, it only takes one step going forward for China to decide, for example, at least as far as these major BRI projects are concerned, they want to settle in renminbi, and there are many ways to make this happen. Now, if that happens, this will be one of the many, many examples to push for greater internalization of the renminbi. And when that happens, I'm afraid it will take place at the expense of the dominance of the US dollar. So I do hope some of the policy makers in Washington really think very carefully about what they are doing. I think we need to give credit to the Chinese government that they are not playing fire by rushing through the internalization of the renminbi. They are not taking great delight in, for example, pushing the renminbi into the BRI framework or into the global trading system, for example. They have been very cautious, very slow, very prudent in doing this. But if you really want to put more pressure on China, I'm afraid it will be the natural extension of the next step that the Chinese government may have to do to accommodate for the changes in the market. And I think, you know, even though, as you mentioned, the US government set up an entity uh, with some equity investment in companies, but I, I remember, and I hesitate to quote this, the Chinese foreign minister, upon learning that decision, said, what, so small amount? You probably need to increase that by 10 times to make a small impact on the world. So I think we really need to be realistic as to what to do. I personally believe China and the United States can really join hands in promoting greater connectivity, not only here in the United States, but in many other parts of the world. China is not an enemy of the United States, in my best judgment. I think in Beijing, I'm considered as a pro American person, and sometimes I'm under increasing pressure because of that characterization. But here in the United States, I still want to emphasize that the greater friendship between the two countries, between the two business communities, the greater it will be for the benefits of the American people as well as for the Chinese people. And I think it takes a lot of courage, wisdom, and vision for us to get over the current difficulties in our bilateral relations. And the business community can actually have a major role to play. We need to do the right thing. Thank you. Great. Uh, question here, just wait for the microphone. Hi, uh, this is Stan Fong here from Jitao Ventures. Um, I'm a venture capitalist in both years in China. Uh, Actually, just speculate a little bit. Uh, we have one more year left in the current administration, Trump's administration, and who knows who, who, what will happen next five years. Uh, yeah, there are only two paths, right? Trump stay on or he doesn't stay on. Let's take the speculative move that if he stays on for another four years, uh, what will happen? Uh, I, I couldn't figure out what will happen. So can you give some projection? You have, there's a five more years of Trump versus a, a new administration. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Craig, <laughs> you trying to hand it off? Uh, I'm going to hand it to you. Um, okay. Uh, let me say that um, I do think that the two governments are uh, reaching towards an accord in the near term. Uh, yesterday, the president said that 
the uh, agreement uh, phase, the so-called phase one, may come, quote unquote, earlier than expected. So I do think uh, that there is an uh, effort by both governments uh, to de-escalate uh, and to redu reduce uh, the amount of tension, if not the amount of tariffs. So that is a good sign. Maybe uh, we could hope that we are currently at peak tariff and, and we'll be going down from here. Um, but I would not assume that um, at all. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury has also stated that absent uh, forward progress, that the President uh, intends to implement uh, the final round, well, the latest round of tariffs on December 15th, uh, covering virtually all consumer goods. And I think that we must assume that the President is speaking truthfully uh, when he said that, and that he has authority to do that uh, if he would, uh, if he wishes. So uh, it looks like both governments are reaching towards uh, an agreement uh, in uh, the uh, uh, November uh, time period, either at Chile or around Chile, uh, and uh, that that agreement uh, will probably be less than what the U.S. side had hoped for, uh, and um, it will lead to a reduction of tariffs to some degree. Uh, it will not lead, uh, however, uh, to a elimination of the tariffs uh, because not uh, all of the issues have been resolved. That would be for phase uh, two. So, but which tariffs will come down? How much will they come down? When will they come down? Uh, in return for what? Um, and uh, what uh, would be the objectives of phase two are all very murky. Um, I would not, uh, as a, a former trade negotiator, uh, been, I've watched this movie many times, and generally um, I think that uh, uh, the negotiations will break up uh, at around 6 a.m. before President Trump and President Xi meet. Both trade negotiators will go and take a shower uh, and have their staff prepare documents. Uh, they will present to uh, the leaders who will either agree or not agree. And uh, only on November 16th after that meeting will we really know where we stand. And hopefully we'll know where we stand. Uh, after Osaka, uh, the G20, uh, uh, or Buenos Aires, uh, the last uh, meetings, um, uh, we, there was an agreement, but actually we didn't really know where we st stood and the agreement fell apart very quickly. Um, let us hope that that is not repeated, uh, that we're able to get to a, a document that companies uh, can uh, use to provide greater uh, uh, transparency and predictability. Uh, that would be our, our hope and our objective. Um, and I'm sorry I can't go out further than one month. <laughs> but I think that that's pretty good anyway, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Does anyone else want to add to what does five more years of Donald Trump mean? I mean, at the very least, it seems that it gives China a chance to move rightly into global leadership role. You know, if Trump continues the pattern of pulling out of everything, and particularly, you know, he, he's reaffirming the America's pull out of the Paris Climate Accords. That is an opportunity for China to step up into a leadership role that befits China and that the world needs. And I think we're out of time. So uh, I want to thank everyone and thank our panel for a great discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank